Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Wednesday to learn about cooking without a kitchen with Sherry Davis. Um, the opening code is going to be of glove, and I will type it here in the chat. <laughs> I love it. Chat box <laughs> of glove. <laughs> um, Today, um, like I said, you're going to learn to cook without a kitchen. Sherry's going to share her expertise with you. This is something that she definitely shines in as a teacher, um, and she does on a daily basis. So I hope you learn a lot about from what she has learned um, throughout the years and what she is implementing in her classroom that does not have a kitchen now. Um, so. Um, of course, Sherry's going to go over her PowerPoint, uh, then we'll do the closing code, the evaluations, and I'll give you guys your homework. Um, a couple of reminders real quick. Braille Challenge registration is open. If you have not registered for the Braille Challenge near you, please do so. Um, ATIA is coming next week, which is the Assistive Technology Industries Association con Conference, and their vendor hall is free. To see what's new and going on in technology, I really encourage you to attend. Hit that vendor hall. You do have to register. Just go to the ATI web website, um, and you can register and choose vendor hall and do that for free. Um, then the next couple of webinars that we have coming up, one on accessible calculators with me on January 26th, and then apps for access. We'll be focusing on iPad apps on February 16th. All right, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Sherry. Hi, everyone. I'm glad you joined us today. This is my first webinar. I hope I do a good job. I have a lot of information to share, and I'm excited to share it with everybody. This is a fun topic, so I hope you find it fun, too. Let me wait for my PowerPoint to come up here. I see some familiar names out there. Some of you I know. Okay, cooking without a kitchen. Who needs a stove or running water? You can cook in a room, in a hallway, in a pod, without a kitchen or running water. And I'm going to show you how and what you can do. So first a little bit about me. Um, before I was a teacher, I was a parent. Um, I have a 28-year-old son who was born with Leber's amaurosis. He also has Asperger's and Tourette's syndrome. Um, so I had a lot of on-the-job training um, before I became a teacher. Went back to school when he was four. Been in Hillsborough County for uh, almost 17 years. Been a vision teacher since 2004 and been in a lot of different settings. Um, I started as an itinerant and um, I've cooked in uh, elementary schools in the middle of a kindergarten pod. Um, I've cooked in uh, a culinary classroom within a high school with an itinerant student. Um, I've cooked in ESE classrooms that typically have full kitchens. You just have to go ask teachers um, if their room is available and when it's available. Um, and uh, I've cooked in classrooms with the whole class with my vision student as like a little push-in activity. I'm going to try to get a little more centered here. I think I'm off screen. Um, so I'm going to show you different things that you can do. Okay, before you start cooking, you need to know why, why do we teach cooking? Why is it important to our students? Why do you need to start as early as you can? Um, and how do you connect it to uh, ECC and the, the Florida standards? So uh, Andrea was um, sweet enough to connect me to the CPOMS standards um, and then connect me, I kind of connected it to the ECC. Um, so up here you'll see the first standard demonstrating appropriate personal eating table skills using non-visual or uh, low vision um, strategies. Um, very important, fork and knife skills, table setting, self-serving. Uh, if students are ever going to date, <laughs> or have uh, a job interview that's over a lunch or a, a business lunch. Um, you can imagine what it would be like to sit with someone who doesn't have simple fork and knife skills or know how to use different utensils, how to serve themselves from a, a serving bowl. Uh, it doesn't look pretty. And I've learned that uh, firsthand from my own son, trying to teach him table manners and appropriate eating skills. Um, it's super important, um, especially in middle school and high school, where 
um, if you're sitting at a table at lunch and a student has got food all over their face, uh, not using a napkin, eating with their fingers, foods that they shouldn't be eating with their fingers, um, people are going to shy away from that child. And um, it's, not, it's not fun. And they end up eating alone every day and they wonder why. So we're going to teach them how to be part of a social group while eating and have appropriate skills. Um, that second um, standard uh, goes with identifying steps, demonstrate the ability to store and prepare food safely using non-visual or low vision strategies. Um, you have to understand safe meat handling, understand cross-contamination, uh, don't cut your vegetables on the same cutting board that you're cutting your meat, um, wash your hands after touching meat, touching an egg, a broken egg, things like that. Um, using containers and foil and baggies uh, can be challenging. Um, there's a lot of uh, steps that you can take to um, help students understand leftover storage um, and using all of those different materials. Um, and the third one uh, is identifying strategies for managing personal wellness uh, using non-visual or low vision strategies. Uh, the personal wellness, we're going to talk a little later about nutrition and the MyPlate. Um, dot gov um, concept and uh, portion control that goes along with self-advocacy, understanding your health, eating eating healthy, um, watching your weight, measuring your portions. Um, that all comes into play with all the standards. So you can see that they're directly related. They're all needed to be uh, an independent, functioning adult uh, with uh, work. Eating eating is connected to work. You eat lunch with your uh, co-workers, uh, and social life, dating, um, and so on. Okay, please uh, let me know if you have any questions as we go along, okay? Any ideas you want to share? I am open to any anything new. Okay, here's how we can match up the, um, the academic area of school with the ECC skills and with cooking. Um, in math, I work on fractions by using the measuring cups measuring spoons, um, measurement, um, simple guesstimates with foil, um, multiplication and division when you're, uh, um, you have a recipe and you need to either half it or double it or triple or quadruple it. Um, so you need all the basic math skills um, to do that kind of activity. In literacy, you have to uh, read your recipes. Um, you have to comprehend uh, different a cooking type of words, what does fold mean, uh, what does roll out mean, um, you know, uh, separate, all those kinds of terms, following the recipes, working in a sequential order, order uh, tax analyzing, uh, not skipping a step, ending up with something that you can't eat. Um, you can introduce Nemeth code or reinforce Nemeth code using the various symbols, the math symbols for measurements. Social skills, uh, I have students working together in my uh, non-kitchen classroom, um, problem solving, delegating, you do this part, I'll do that part, taking and giving directions from each other, um, so that helps with that. Um, technology, using a PC or an iPad, uh, later on I'll show you the Directions for Me website, um, and it's specifically for the visually impaired to get directions on packaged foods. Um, uh, just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, so using the internet to lo locate recipes, um, using this website to get directions, uh, and using uh, all the assistive technology that we have while you're doing that. So you're kind of combining cooking, recipe planning, and technology all in one lump lesson. Self-determination, okay, again we talked about health, understanding portion control, nutrition, um, Keeping you know, keeping a healthy weight, keeping a healthy diet. I have students um, at the school where I teach. I'm in Armwood, by the way. I should have said that earlier. I'm at Armwood High School in Hillsborough County. It's a resource classroom. Uh, we have 12, uh, 13 now visually. Well, one just withdrew. So 12 visually impaired students in the school. Nine of them are direct. Three of them are consult. Um, actually, eight of them are direct now. Uh, four of them are consult. Um, so all those direct students come into our classroom every day, um, and they cook. We cook biweekly. Okay, I try to coordinate with my with my paycheck. <laughs> so because I'm I'm buying all the ingredients myself. Um, a lot of times I'll bring in tools from home. So uh, 
anyway, I digress. So, um, so self-determination, okay, I have students, what I was going for is I have students that, um, in my classroom that um, one young man only eats uh, um, tomato soup and like chicken nuggets from McDonald's. Um, and so we, you know, we want to get him involved in cooking to experience different foods. And it's not that he has allergies or uh, has to eat gluten-free or is on a special diet. He just has food issues. Um, and so cooking with him opens up different worlds. Uh, I worked with him at the Lighthouse a couple summers ago. And I actually got him to try um, breakfast sausage for the first time using a George Foreman grill. Um, so that was like a, you know, um, a feat. Completed. Okay, again, we can talk about career exploration through cooking. I have a young man in my class um, who uh, has um, an interest in culinary. He's in the culinary class. Um, he has really good cooking skills. Um, so I'm trying to kind of steer him towards a culinary career, um, event planning, working for a caterer. All of that is connected to cooking. So if you have some good basic cooking skills, it might lead um, to a possible job, you know. Uh, sensory efficiency, okay, using our tactile skills and vision to um, use all the tools that we're going to share later on today uh, to, to be able to complete a recipe, um, use all different kinds of appliances. And then assistive technology, we use Zoom text in the class, JAWS. Uh, and then um, an iPad, the um, voiceover on iPad to access the directions for me or to find recipes and so on. Anybody got any questions or anything so far, ideas? Okay, so in order to cook with a student, you really should have a goal and objective, okay? You have to kind of assess where the student is on their understanding, no matter what their um, level is if you have a kindergartner uh, you want to speak with their parents about are they able to get into are they allowed in the kitchen I've had students who aren't allowed in the kitchen even to get a bottle of water out of the refrigerator um, some parents have a lot of fear about kitchen and their visually impaired child so you need to assess the student and talk with parents specifically when they're young what are what are they comfortable doing in the kitchen can they go get a pop tart out of a box in the, in the cabinet um, can they find a bottle of water in the refrigerator? Can they do any kind of simple pouring? Um, so these are things you want to look at first and assess. And then write an appropriate goal. I wrote a, a, an example here. This is probably for a higher um, higher functioning student, an older student, I should say. Um, but you could, you could simplify it and um, write it for a younger student. I've done uh, oatmeal in a closet with a microwave for a, a kindergarten student. My, my room was literally in a closet that they cleaned out for me. I had a table, I had a rug, I had brought a little um, little desk in, and I put a microwave on top of that, and we would make popcorn, which is for the kindergartner, and oatmeal. Um, so that was definitely without a kitchen, and it was in a closet, <laughs> and we still cooked. And then I shared with his mom that he could do it and encouraged her to do it at home. So here's a simple goal. Um, using accommodations for visual impairment, modifications to equipment, direct instruction and monthly opportunities to prepare food, Susie will safely demonstrate cutting, measuring, food handling, utensil skills, and appliance use, seven of nine opportunities during an 18-week period. And of course, you adjust it to uh, the level of your student. Um, and then I have a bunch of suggested um, objectives there. I'll give you a minute just to kind of read over those. Um, and you can pick and choose. I have another page here. So we want to demonstrate safe cutting and slicing, using measuring cups and spoons, spreading foods. That's a big challenge. Um, spreading foods is hard. I came up with a, I don't know if I saw it from someone, a lot, a lot of the strategies you, you learn, you, you see someone else do. And you're like, hey, I'm taking it. So um, with my son, I use squeezable condiments. And I'll, I'll talk about that later a little bit. Um, squeezable mayonnaise, squeezable mustard, uh, obviously squeezable ketchup. So if you're making a sandwich with mayonnaise or mustard um, and you want to um, get it on the bread before the meat, um, a squeezable um, utensil, or sorry, a squeezable container, uh, you kind of center it over the bread. 
squeeze it onto your center of your bread and then put your other piece of bread on top and just kind of lightly rotate the bread. Here's my two hands. Okay, and that kind of spreads the condiment around a little bit. Okay, um, that's good to start young. Okay, you make a sandwich. Now, you can't do that with peanut butter and jelly, obviously. That's a spreading issue with the knife, working from top to bottom, um, starting on top of your bread, pulling the knife down, flattening the knife, pulling the knife down to the bottom of the bread. Um, but if you're making a sandwich with mayonnaise and mustard, um, trying that squeeze and then use your bread as two pieces to kind of spread around uh, helps. Um, let's go to the next list. Okay, more objectives here. Table setting. I'd be amazed. I work at the lighthouse full time or part time with uh, transition. Um, and you'd be amazed at how many uh, high school students have no idea how to set a table. And probably that's because a lot of families aren't eating together anymore. People are eating separately. They're eating in front of the TV. Um, so proper table setting. You know, your fork goes on the left. Your knife goes close on the right, closest to your plate, with the cutting edge in toward the plate. Your spoon goes next to the next to the knife on the right. Um, important to learn. Okay, napkin goes under the fork on the left. Okay, so it's just simple table setting. Um, using a knife and fork to cut foods. I have some suggestions for that later. Using a microwave, a modified toaster oven, a blender, George Foreman grill. Best piece of equipment that has come out, in my opinion for the visually impaired, especially the totally blind. Having a George Foreman grill opened up a world of foods for my son, okay? Cooking chicken breasts, pork chops, hot dogs, sausage, a steak. Um, instead of just microwaving and, and using toaster oven for chicken nuggets all the time, he actually can make a piece of meat, a hamburger, a piece of good meat um, for himself on the George Foreman grill, okay? Best piece of equipment I recommend. Electric skillet, a um, little bit different, got to deal with the heat, but if they have the skills to do, it's good for simple casseroles, things that mix together, um, and accessing recipes and directions, using technology to do that. So those are all sample objectives. Um, and I think later on we're going to talk about homework assignment, maybe being a lesson plan for one of these objectives. Okay. All right, who's responsible? Um, uh, how to get parents and, guardi and guardians involved. Uh, a long time ago I had a high school student um, and I knew at home he wasn't doing anything for himself. Um, so I actually put his grandmother who was raising him on the IEP as a responsible party along with myself um, but I had her listed as a responsible party too. You know on the bottom of the I, you know on the bottom of that goal and objective page you have to put um, who's responsible for implementing this these goals and objectives. So I listed her with her approval. She was at the IEP. And um, what I did was make up a weekly checklist um, for him. Uh, did he, and I included other daily living activities too. I had laundry. I wanted him to start doing his laundry. So I had things about um, putting clothes in the washer and transferring them to the dryer. And, you know, um, and then in the kitchen, um, I would send home the recipes that we would do at school and then give him homework, cooking homework. And his grandmother was to sign off that he did indeed prepare this home, this meal or food, sometimes just a simple snack. Um, but did he do this at home? Did, is he carrying it over from school to home? Because if they're not going to do that, uh, sometimes it's, it's frustrating. It's like, what's the point? I'm doing all this with you at school, but you're not seeing it in the real world in your own kitchen. Um, and so uh, getting the parents involved and giving them some responsibility is really, really important. So, but check with your county first, okay? It was okay with Hillsborough County that I did that. Um, so always check with your county first and make sure that that's okay for you to do. All right, so how do you, how do you deal with a parent or a, a principal that says, what, you're going to put a knife in that blind kid's hand? Um, there's a lot of fear that goes into, you know, people with visual impairments, especially totally blind students, being in the kitchen. Okay, let me see if I have any notes to go with this. Um, so you need to assure parents that you're going to be, you know, supervising their student at all times, especially when there's sharp implements. <laughs> um, 
and that you're going to you know, make sure that all the modifications um, and accommodations are in place. Okay, you're supervising them. Um, and you want to ask them, you know, when do you expect your child to start doing things for themselves? Because I think sometimes parents forget that they're, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten year old little Johnny who is totally blind is going to grow up one day. And what do they want to be doing for that little boy? You know, if he's 15, 16, 20, 25, still living at home, um, you still want to have to cook for them every day and pour their juice, okay? Put their toothpaste on the toothbrush. I mean, not a good idea. So our kids take more repetitions. They take longer to learn skills sometimes. They definitely take more repetitions, more practice, more hands-on. So the younger you can start, the better. Um, I did not learn this with my son. I started late with him, and it was a struggle. So I speak from experience. I mean, if he was allowed in the kitchen and he got snacks, dried foods, things for himself out of the pantry. But I did not start with cutting and cooking and using appliances um, until he was a little bit older, probably like middle school. So he kicked and, you know, fought a little bit, but now he can completely make a meal for himself using many different types of appliances and tools. Um, and help, under, help parents understand that it just looks different. It's not going to be how you would do it. It's going to be a little messier. Um, it's going to take a little longer, okay? It's, it's going to look different than what they're used to cooking. You're not teaching them how to cook the way you cook. You're teaching them how to cook the way they need to learn how to cook using all their accommodations um, and, and specific tools, okay? Oop, I think I skipped a page here. Okay. For administrators, all right, go ahead and, and share the ECC. Um, there's a really good, um, can I just hold this up to the camera, Andrea? Sure. A really good document called Expanded Core Curriculum. It's from um, NH Vision Education. It's one page, okay, it's got all the different areas, front and back. I keep this in my binder. It's got all the areas listed. So this is a great, simple document to hand to an administrator um, and say, this is my curriculum, and here are all the areas that I'm touching on when I cook. Um, so sharing that with them, providing an IEP, a copy of an IEP to them with all their food prep and goals, okay? Invite them to watch you cook one time when you're there. Invite them to a little luncheon where the elementary student's going to make a sandwich for them or a middle school student's going to make macaroni and cheese or a high school student is going to make a casserole in the skillet, okay, in the electric skillet. Um, ensure that students are always supervised, okay, we don't want to miss any fingers, no, no digits, can't be a braille reader if you've cut off the tip of your index finger, so, but you still have to learn how to use a knife even though you're a braille reader, so um, you've, you know, got to teach safety. I tried to find, there's, Publix makes this cute little, um, and I couldn't find um, one, uh, it's a little finger guard. They're usually hanging like on those little clips that you go down the aisle and they're on the side. Um, it's a little rubber finger guard. It's got a little place for your index finger and a little place for your thumb, and it's got like a bumpy surface on the inside. So you hold it, and then when you're holding your fruit or vegetable that you're cutting, your knife is, is touching the device, the, the little protector on your finger, okay? And so that kind of um, helps a lot of kids with a lot of their knife fears. Um, uh, so if the knife, you know, accidentally rotates, which is a big issue with wrist rotation when you're cutting, um, that kind of helps. So I found one at Publix. So take a look at Publix, just a couple of dollars, okay? Um, and then, you know, be the advocate for your students. Okay, with both parents and administrators. Let them know how important it is that they that students get these skills because parents aren't always taking the initiative. But if you start and show some, take video, get permission, show video of your students cooking, okay, during your lesson and send it to a parent and let them see, ooh, you can measure in a measuring cup and you can pour and you can pour milk into a cereal bowl. Okay, sometimes kids don't want to do stuff for themselves. So they pretend like they can't because they just want mommy to do it or daddy to do it. So um, take a video and send it home, and then maybe things will get started for students.
Okay, here's my first video. This is indeed my classroom that does not have a kitchen. We have a technology area there. That's my intern's desk. Copy machine. That little area in the back there um, is my kitchen. I have a teeny little refrigerator and a table with a microwave and a toaster oven on top. And then we store our skillet and our George Foreman grill. Okay, student tables, teacher desk, our ECC tree, and the hallway. So I do not have a kitchen. I don't have running water. I don't have running water. Um, I don't have a stove. Uh, luckily, I do have a culinary classroom across the hall. So um, what we do is that um, we keep a big Rubbermaid tub, big like, you know, three foot by two foot Rubbermaid tub, and that is our dirty dish collector. Um, so as we're cooking and things get dirty, we just throw it in there, and then at the end of the day, we go over and wash up in the culinary room. Okay, we have our own hand towels and, and drying towels and everything, soap and sponges, and we just carry it all over and we just use their sink. So most high schools have lots of classrooms with sinks. Some teachers have a full kitchen in their room. They don't even need it. They're a social studies teacher. Uh, you just have to find that room in the high school or middle school. And then most kindergarten classrooms, somewhere in their pod or between the two rooms that they share, there is a sink. Um, so you just have to do a little reconnaissance um, before you get started and kind of find, find the people that have the sink, make friends, bring them cookies, and ask if you can use their 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 sink and their oven if you need to. Okay, what appliances can you use without a kitchen? Lots. Okay, you can use a blender, smoothies, puddings, waffle batter, uh, soups, dips. Okay, simple. That's a good elementary, making a smoothie, an elementary activity. Um, you schlep it all in, you bring in your blender from home, you bring in all your ingredients, I've carried coolers, little hand-carried coolers into the into um, schools, big old tote bag with my blender, um, and you set up, you find a plug, and you have a lesson. Okay, cutting the strawberries to put in to the smoothie. So you've got cutting on a cutting board. You've got um, uh, tactile um, skills with uh, the blender. Of course, you've modified the blender um, if need be. And make sure you bring cups and straws and paper towels, everything you need to clean up. And sometimes I've just schlepped the dirty things home. I just make sure it's a, a tote that I don't mind getting dirty. And I'll just throw all my dirty things in there. Or I use the local ladies room <laughs> and clean out things as best I can and take it home. This, the objective is not the cleaning. It's not the beginning to ending activity of using a blender, finding the blender, setting up the blender, using the blender, and cleaning up the blender. What your objective is maybe slicing the strawberries, pouring in some milk, spooning in some yogurt, and using some tactile skills to find the buttons, okay? And then pouring into a cup. That's kind of your objective. So don't worry about all the beginning skills and all the ending skills that go into that. You know, you can't do that. Kind of pick your battles. Pick, be specific about your objective for that lesson. So um, the microwave, you can see there, you can make any kind of packaged food. We make Hot Pockets. Um, We've made a cake in a mug. I didn't know how many how many recipes in a mug there were. <laughs> um, but when I got to Armour, there was a whole recipe book. There's cheesecake in a mug and chocolate cake in a mug and French toast in a mug. All that's microwavable. So it was really cool. Um, oatmeal, of course. Um, you can make bacon in the microwave if that's what you like. Um, of course, scrambled eggs in a Tupperware container with a little bit of milk and a little bit of margarine or butter. You've got a scrambled egg. Um, breakfast. The George Foreman grill, anything, chicken breast, boneless, chork, pork, boneless pork chops, hamburgers, uh, sausage. I like the Johnsonville sausage. Um, we made the sweet sausage um, before the Christmas break in my classroom. Kids loved it. They didn't even know that this kind of sausage, they just thought it was there was only breakfast sausage. You know, there was like a dinner type of sausage. We brought in hot dog rolls and mustard and ketchup and everything. And um, and we made them on the George Foreman grill. Everything cooks faster on the George Foreman grill. And the only thing you do to plug it in, to turn it on, is plug it in. There are no dials. Uh, one, one model has a little slide dial that gives you like a, a low heat to a high heat. Um, so, but other than that, you plug it in, it's on, you let it heat up, you put your meat on it, you close the lid. 
Um, there's no flipping, no spatulas. It cooks on both sides. It cooks in a shorter period of time. You can make a medium-sized chicken breast in about um, nine minutes. Okay, sausage took about 13 minutes. Hamburgers take about nine minutes. So it's a much quicker way of cooking, and you're actually getting something that's not out of a package or frozen or microwaved. It's, to me, it's true cooking, because then you can heat up a vegetable in the microwave or make a salad, and you've got a decent rounded meal. Anyone else have problems with parent pushback? That was you asking. OK. <laughs> um, toaster ovens are pretty self-explanatory. OK, you can make tater tots. Any kind of, you know, the little uh, pizza rolls, um, egg rolls, all kinds of things. You can make toast. <laughs> Who ever thought of making toast in a toaster oven? You can heat up chicken nuggets, okay, anything that's kind of frozen and, and, uh, and related there. So the electric skillet allows you to make pancakes. Uh, we made picadillo. I have a picture. I think, I, I don't know if I spelled that right. If we have anybody out there that knows how to spell picadillo, let me know if I spelled that right. It's a, I, had a, I had a Cuban... Um, uh, uh, an intern with a Cuban ancestry. So she, um, during uh, um, Hispanic Heritage Month, she made a lesson and uh, she did picadillo, which is like a ground meat. We did ground chicken. It's tomato paste. It's cut up uh, peppers and tomato and onion. So we had a cutting activity. Um, uh, you had to brown the meat. Okay, actually, I actually browned the meat at home for, for time purposes because I only have 50 minute periods. For time purposes, I browned the meat at home and brought it in. Again, the lesson was not browning meat. It was setting up the skillet and learning the, what, what a, a kind of dish can you make in an in a electric skillet, OK? Um, everyone knows what an electric skillet is, right? I know we have some young teachers out there. Is that kind of an old? <laughs> Is that kind of an old-fashioned thing? Does everyone know what an electric skillet is? Let me know if everyone knows. It's, it's like a big Google frying. It. Yeah. Google it. Huh? Go Google it. Yeah, go Google it. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like a frying pan that you plug in. And, you, you know, so. <laughs> oh, Tanoi. Hi, Tanoi. <laughs> um, so that's what you can make, okay? So next I have some pictures of how you can adapt those type of um, and thank you, Andrea, for making this slide for me at the last minute. Okay, there's the famous of glove. Um, this glove is amazing. You can put your hand on the grate in the oven, right, Tanoi? Because we cook together at the lighthouse. You can put your hand on the grate in the oven. It goes up to like 450 degrees. Okay, you can touch anything with this glove. And the, that blue non-skid um, surface is on both sides of the glove. So I always buy two. My son uses them. Um, I buy two, so both hands are protected. And it's not a mitt. When you wear a mitt, you lose all tactile idea of where your hands are, at least the students that I've worked with. Um, you can't individualize your fingers. You can't you know, separate them. You can't get grips on things. You can't adjust. So the of glove lets you have more dexterity with your hands. It protects you to really high heat. Um, and you can get two, and they go on both hands because that blue protective is on both sides of that glove. So you can buy another one, flip it over, and wear it on the other hand. Okay. My son uses them actually as spatulas and serving. He he loses all control of anything that is extended from his body. He's got some spatial issues. So a spatula to him was extremely challenging. He could not mentally map where the food was related to his spatula. Um, I even tried the little squeezable spatulas that have the, you know, the little kind of squeezy spatulas that have the spatula on both sides okay, that go in, squeeze the food, and then you flip it over. Um, I tried those. He, he just could not orient himself. So the of glove is a washable spatula because he'll just reach into the toaster oven and, and get, you know, a chicken breast or, or, or a chicken nugget or a toast, tater tot or he'll take the meat right off of the George Foreman and place it on his plate. Is it ideal? No, but it works for him and he can cook for himself. Okay, he can he can feed himself and make a meal. Um, you know, maybe as he gets older and he retries different things, you know, we can revisit that. But right now it works for him. 
So he uses those to touch the food and actually serve it and get it out of the appliance. Um, that little rival dial, that is the um, electric skillet that I use, okay? And we use black puff paint to um, make a tactile mark at each, at each temperature in the off. And then you can see on the right, uh, there's a, another black dot so that you know that you're matching the dot that's next to the temperature up to that stationary dot. So if you want to, you know, set your skillet to 350 degrees, well, thank you there with that green arrow. You just turn your dial, okay, to the left to match your 350 up with your black dot, okay, and you've set your temperature, all right? I've done that with um, my um, dishwasher at home, uh, so my son can start the dishwasher. Uh, I have it on my toaster oven at home. Um, it, puff paint. Puff paint is your friend. Get a little tube of puff paint because it's great for all kinds of uh, adaptations. Let me show you some more pictures. Oh, you went ahead. Oh, you went ahead for me, Andrea. That's okay. No, that's all right. There's our microwave in the classroom. You can see, okay, we have the Braille on it. And then we just have, um, we have um, numbers on the number dial, of course. But at home, I just use scotch tape. I had a flat front microwave. And um, I just use little squares of scotch tape, which is see-through. So everyone else in the family can use the microwave. But Matthew was able to tactually identify the numbers. And I had a little um, clear raised dot on the 5. So he could orient and he could use the microwave. But it didn't impair everyone else in the family from using the microwave. OK? Um, and then we have our, it's our brand new toaster oven we just got. So I actually used the clear um, tactile dots. And they actually acted as like a little uh, magnifier on the numbers, which was kind of neat to see. So I have a little clear tactile um, dot on each temperature. And then I have Braille up here. That's temp. And in the middle, we have function. OK. And then I actually have Braille. I have BK for bake, B for broil, and T for toast. And I just use those little APH letter sticker pages and just cut them down, trim them down. OK. And then we have timer. And of course, again, I have the little clear dots on each of the minutes. You know, so you actually, and then the, the little lines on the dials are, are raised just a bit, so they can, you can match up. Um, so when you're buying appliances, um, tell parents to actually look for appliances that have some raised dials. Everything's not touch, um, everything's not flat-faced, because it makes it very hard to adapt. So share with parents to specifically look for appliances for their own kitchens that are easy to adapt. Um, and have some some tactile features to them, okay. Um, and of course, you would you would teach you would teach the appliance. That would be your first lesson with a new appliance. How do we use this new appliance? How do we find all the options that we need? And that would be a lesson. Okay. So you can teach measuring. Okay, you can make trail mix, instant pudding, glop, which is that like cornstarch and water and something else in there. It's not edible. It's not a cooking thing, but but it's fun for um, uh, elementary kids. Okay, They still have to measure and, and pour and spoon, and, and then they can make glop and play with that. Or, um, or you can make the dried soups, where you have the little dehydrated soups and you add water. Okay, you can measure that. You can slice and cut cheese sticks, bananas, cucumbers, waffles. Um, you can teach how to spread. These are all things you can do when you don't need a kitchen. You can spread peanut butter and jelly, cream cheese, butter, fork use. Um, Cheetos with little ones, um, it's fun. It's, you know, you take like or the, the puffy Cheetos um, and then teach the kids how to, how to um, cut them in half. You can do a knife and fork activity by cutting them in half, or you can already cut them in half. And then if you just want to teach fork use, how to locate with a pusher on your plate and use a fork. Um, Cheetos is a fun way. All kids like Cheetos. They make a nice, interesting <laughs> sound when you when you spear them. Um, so it makes it fun to teach kids fork use. Okay, um, green beans, anything that's not going to like roll around and move. Meatballs cut in half. Okay, so they're not rolling around all over the all over the plate. Again, knife and fork skills. Um, you can cut fig newtons in half. You can cut waffles, pop tarts, cucumbers after you cut them lengthwise. 
Um, and I have a video showing that. Ooh, Picadillo is a slight sin, offense, or trifling fault. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Well, I know that's a Picadillo. Yeah, like when you make a little faux pas, right? But <laughs> So how do I spell it? Who <laughs> gave me a... P-I-C. P-I-C. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Who, oh, gluten-free pancakes in one of those. Oh, what in the uh, Mia says, so in the, um, in the, in the electric skillet, yeah. Ooh, gluten-free pancakes. Mmm. Yes, the glove is awesome. Yes, it is. Yep. Uh, let's see next time. Let's see in the next slide. Yeah, these are just pictures. So, so here's how I've, I've adapted cutting spoons. Uh, cutting spoons. I'm looking at, <laughs> I'm looking at one picture and talking about this picture. Measuring spoons and measuring cups. So you can use the little braille. I use the label maker. Um, the little cha-ching, cha-ching label maker um, for the measuring cups. These are, these are my home ones for my son. Um, or you can use puff paint um, on, on either. Uh, one dot for one cup, two dots for half cup, three dots for a third, four for a fourth cup. Okay? Um, it's a quick, easy way, a tactile way to um, find the right spoon that you want. Ooh, candied sweet potatoes for Thanksgiving. Ooh, in the microwave? Mia, did you make those in the microwave? Electric skillet. Ooh. Mm. Did you get the little marshmallows on top? <laughs> no. Oh. Well, they're, I bet they're still good. All right, other skills you can do without a kitchen? Egg cracking. That's a big skill. Um, you don't need a kitchen. You just, um, and I have a, a video of that. You need a tray and lots of paper towels <laughs> and something to break your egg into. Um, and preferably something, um, a size that they're, they have an awareness of. And you, you'll see in the video. Um, tool identification. I did this last year. I was part-time at a middle school. Um, and I had two young men who were um, totally blind. And they love to play kitchen utensil Jeopardy. Um, and we actually had little buzzers um, that they could ring in on. And so first I would get out like about a dozen small tools, a spatula, a whisk, um, um, certain, you know, like a small pot, um, a can opener. You know, think of all the different small tools in, that you have in the kitchen. And I would individually you know, have them t touch them, explain what they do, what their function is, how to use it, have them kind of, you know, move all the parts, okay? So we'd go through all of those, and then they'd be set out on the on a kitchen counter. Um, I did have a kitchen last year at the middle school. Um, and then, so we, we paid specific attention to the name of the tool and its function, okay? So once I let them, oriented them to all the utensils, um, they're put down, and then I'd ask, you know, the function question, right? I want to flip a hamburger in a frying pan. And they'd have to buzz in and say, what is a, what is a spatula? Um, so they loved it. And so they'd get points and, you know, um, have a little friendly competition. So that's called Kitchen Utensil Jeopardy. Tanoi and I actually did that um, with a wheel. She actually, <laughs> we had the, the utensil wheel of fortune. What did we call it, Tanoi? Uh, we did that during college week uh, with, um, with transition students. We had a little utensil game. Um, table cleaning, of course, is very important. Systematic cleaning, using a grid, top to bottom, you know, left to right, overlapping, working from left to right, um, orienting yourself to your space, very important. Tactile discrimination with all kinds of different items. Um, and good hand washing, okay? Um, I've seen students that, like, wash their hands like this. You know, it's like, uh, that's not hand washing. So what does good hand washing mean? And that's something you can start with, with you know, elementary kids. Now, you have to find a sink, of course, because you don't have a sink in your room. So um, you need to find, you know, one of those classrooms we talked about earlier with a sink and actually work on a hand washing skill. I don't remember, but it was fun, yeah. <laughs> Okay, here's a video of a young man we have at Armwood, um, Shannon. He is measuring peanut butter. He is new to Braille. He's uh, lost his vision uh, suddenly and recently. So he is a beginning Braille reader. 
Um, so this was an activity of, um, of measuring, but he had to locate the, you know, the measuring cup that he needed. So let's watch Shannon measure peanut butter. You can see he's very carefully trying to make sure that cup is full. Oh, if you want to set your uh, video to full screen, please feel free. The, yeah, the, the arrow is going in the four directions at the top. So I'm teaching him, I'm showing him how to use his finger flat over the cup to kind of feel if the peanut butter is coming all the way to the top. And you can see the difference. He's, you know, uh, advantageously blind, so he really is using a lot of his visual memory. Looks very different than uh, a student who is congenitally blind. He decided to get the jar and then his hands. <laughs> but, you know, lesson learned. Sometimes you just let things happen. You learn, learn through your own mistakes. Um, learn in the natural environment, natural consequences. So, Okay, now he flipped his wrist away from him. I really try to encourage students to, when they're pouring, uh, I've noticed a lot of, uh, especially congenitally blind students, um, want to flip their wrist back away from their body when they pour. Um, and so a lot of wrist supination is hard, you know, especially for our congenitally blind students. So encourage, you know, um, working toward them, pouring, you know, toward their body, toward the bowl instead of that flipping backward and when you have to lean over and rotate your body in a kind of an awkward way. Another trick um, or another point I'd like to make is that um, I notice a lot of uh, students, um, they want to carry things with their thumbs on the bottom. They have an awkward way of carrying a plate when they're going from one place to another. So really encouraging that thumb on top, um, supinating that wrist, getting that those wrists unlocked. A lot of our congenitally blind kids really have locked wrists and hips, and so encourage the thumb on top when they're carrying, um, rotating wrists instead of the whole arm when they're pouring, um, and then and then again pouring, you know, toward the bowl instead of like rotating that wrist back and away from the bowl. Okay, and here is, um, this is another group, we're making the same thing, but another class. So these are two students you'll see working together, Aaron and Alice. Um, you'll see uh, a use of a catch cup, okay, when, he's, when you're pouring a, a liquid ingredient using a catch cup so that, you know, it eliminates messes. Um, using a knife for leveling. Uh, the student, I handed him the knife, okay. he didn't use it, um, but especially when you're measuring flour, he'll be measuring sugar. When you're measuring flour, teaching that leveling concept where you, you overfill, kind of dig in the bag, overfill, and then kind of push your knife across the uh, cup to measure uh, the flour. Um, using smaller cups to practice um, fractions. Andrea's coming up on me. Do I need something? When you're ready to play, just press play because my Adobe Connect crashed. I'm okay, <laughs> thanks. No, that's okay. Um, using smaller measuring cups to practice fractions, and you'll see how we did that here. And then for low vision kids, using devices like instead of like trying to measure butter out of a tub, use the butter sticks with the print measurements. 
Um, I really haven't come up with a concept for a totally blind student to use those butter sticks unless you make them tactile to begin with. But, um, but visually impaired students um, who use devices, handheld devices, can um, you know, see the measurements and measure their butter that way. And if you measure it and cut it cold, you know, it's a lot easier to cut. Um, don't let it get too soft. You know, cut it and then soften it if you need it for your recipe. So let's go ahead and watch this video. Mm -hmm. I got it. <laughs> you can see he's so excited to be cooking cookies. <laughs> I'm teaching and recording at the same time, so <laughs> see my hand kind of coming in and out. He got sugar on his shirt, distressed. Oh, wow. I like the the braille ruler for the for the butter. Okay, thanks. Natural consequence. <laughs> Aaron is a culinary student, so he's very comfortable in the kitchen. Doesn't always follow the recipe, gets a little ahead of himself, but very comfortable in the kitchen. He's a good role model. Okay. Thank you, Cynthia, for that. Line up the Braille ruler and score it. I like that. Okay. I'm going to use that. All right, egg cracking. This is Andreas. He's a young man um, who's totally blind and has autism. Um, so kitchen skills are quite challenging for him. He's at a you know very beginning level, so we just use the pan to catch the mess. If he broke the rag you know the wrong way or missed the cup, it's all contained. Okay, demonstrate using a knife to crack an egg. I've seen it done different ways, holding it in the palm and then like kind of tapping it with a knife to start that crack, and then kind of opening it or um, you know using the side of the bowl. You just got to try different ways. Trial and error here. Um, you'll hear me say several times to the intern, this is Chantel, my intern, um, to work from behind Andreas. Okay, working so beside a student um, or in front of them doesn't always give you um, a good perspective of what their body is doing. So if you get behind the student and in the same kind of 
position and orientation that they are, it's going to help you kind of understand what they need to do with their body, especially a student who needs as much, as much assistance as Andreas does. Okay. While we were talking about it, he did it. He worries very much about getting shell and when he breaks an egg. This is when we were making a, a cake in a mug. Okay, so our next video is Angel slicing. This is a sl uh, cutting lesson. She's making a salad. Someone was making something in the um, microwave or something, heating something up, and someone was making, and Angel was making the salad. So, um, again, you're going to see how uh, we always cut the cucumber um, lengthwise first to get a flat surface so we're not dealing with a moving object as we're using a sharp knife. Um, and then um, we have a contrasting cutting board. So if you're going to cut an onion, you'd want, you know, like a dark cutting board. You wouldn't want to do a white onion on a white cutting board. Um, we have, um, you can get like black cutting boards or, you know, just dark green or something that's contrasting. So light cutting board for dark foods, dark cutting board for light foods. It's really kind of simple. Oh, are we both tying it? I'm sorry. Yeah, I tried. You're my go-to girl, so I'm sorry. You're back on. Okay. So again, you see I'm keeping close proximity. She's got a knife, so I'm not hovering. I'm not, you know, letting her cut.
You can see she's a little apprehensive. So I'm guiding her through the first couple of cuts. We were making hot pockets this day, so we're having hot pockets and salad. Doesn't have to be fancy; just has to be edible. And you want to you want to get the kids involved, so you have to kind of go where they are as far as what they'll eat. And Right, I didn't have a white one, a white flexible cutting board here for her cucumber, so I didn't want to do the green cucumber on the green cutting board. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> Okay, so this is a video of um, my intern um, orienting Andreas uh, to the electric skillet. There, that's an electric skillet. In case you've got some youngins out there that don't know what one of those is, um, it's just a it's a Teflon coated frying pan. It comes with a lid. It's got four legs. It can stand anywhere. All you need is an electric plug. It heats up. You can set your temperature. Um, and so it's almost like having an oven in the classroom. Um, you can make pancakes. You could do a hamburger helper in there. Um, one of those birds frozen um, dinners, frozen like bag dinners that you just pour in and salt, you know, just kind of simmer, saute, and add different things to it. Um, lots and lots of things in there. So uh, we, we used, I showed you how we used puff paint uh, to orient the dial, so that's what you'll see the intern doing, how to, how to orient him to the dial. Um, and then, again, you can see he'll take one hand away a lot when he's trying to manipulate the dial, and so we encourage him to get both hands in there, okay, to help with orientation. This took quite a while.
So you can see how you keep taking that hand away. And I know he does not get these experiences at home. This is all brand new to him. Okay, so there we have orienting to um, appliances. Here's just some simple suggested recipes. Okay, I think we've uh, talked about these um, already. So you can just, when you, if you print this out, you have them. But it's pretty common sense. Okay. All right, here's some simple little tips you can send home to parents or if, if you, you know, in, in do indeed have a kitchen in your room, you can try these. Um, but these are things I've learned from Matthew. That's my son. Um, bag clips, okay, ba bags of bread, um, rolls, bread. They have those little plastic clips, the little twisties or that little kind of square thing with the hole. You got to like twist the bread and get the plastic in there. Very, very challenging if you have no vision. So I immediately get rid of all those when I shop, and I just use chip clip. So I just clip, you know, twist the bag and clip it. Much easier, okay? If, if anything you can make easier in the kitchen for students gives them more independence, right? That's one less thing you have to help them with. So if you can't get to the bread, you can't make a sandwich. So, but if if you have easy, easy, easy access to the bread, you're going to be more inclined to use it and make a sandwich. Uh, puff paint on toaster ovens, microwaves. I put it on the washer and dryer in my house and on the, on the dishwasher. Anything that has dials and numbers you have to, you know, rotate and match and set. Puff paint and braille letters are great. Um, I use rubber bands in the refrigerator and the pantry to differentiate different condiments. One rubber band means this. Two rubber bands means that. You can do that on cans on uh, bottles in the refrigerator. Um, squeezable condiments, we talked about that earlier. Um, opening boxes of wrapped snacks. Uh, I noticed when um, I would buy like boxes of Pop-Tarts, boxes of granola bars, boxes of raisins. Um, Matthew had no idea which box was, was what. So he'd like I'd come home and every box would be torn open because he's looking for a specific thing. Um, so what I ended up doing is just making a big snack bowl, a big, the biggest bowl I could find. I kept it on the counter, and when I came home, I emptied, you know, the cheese crackers, the granola bars, the pop tarts, the raisins, um, anything that was the little snacky foods in there, because they all have a different shape and a different feel. But the boxes all feel the same in the pantry. So that gave him independence. If he wanted a snack, you just ask permission. I'd say, sure, go grab something. So that gave him independence of finding. That's a nice way to start a student, you know, independently getting something for themselves and not always having to be handed everything, okay? Um, one thing I didn't put on here is pouring for young kids. Um, families like to buy gallons of milk. Um, and it's very hard to control a gallon of milk when you're little and a cup and the gallon and find the spout and match it to the cup and pour and control your arm. So I would um, just 
put smaller amounts in smaller containers. And Matthew knew that that was his milk cup. That his milk that was his milk container in the refrigerator. So it made it easier for him, like a little pitcher, you know, a little lemonade pitcher. Um, so that he knew that that was his container to pour his drink from. So it just it was beginning pouring skills until he was able to get big enough and strong enough to handle a big gallon container. Okay, same with soda bottles, the big liter soda bottles. They're hard to hold with little hands. Um, and so putting it into a smaller container or just buying the smaller containers, you know, the smaller bottles. Uh, so suggestions to parents to just start their child getting into the kitchen and just locating items and getting simple things for themselves. Um, good way to get started. Okay, I'm not going to my next slide here, Miss Andrea. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, this is a nice way to talk about health. It's called myplate.gov. There's all kinds of lesson plans online. Just just go on the myplate.gov website, all kinds of lesson plans. Um, it's an easier way to teach portion control, um, that the old-fashioned food pyramid that we used to learn. Um, it was kind of hard to understand, like, how many servings of this and how many servings of this. This is an ideal way. When you make a plate of food for yourself, they're giving you a nice, visual, tactile way of seeing how much of your plate should be filled with the different food groups, the vegetables, the fruits, the whole grains, the healthy proteins. So um, Tanoi and I actually did want this um, too. We, uh, we got the foam, the tactile um, paper. You can use um, different paper for different food groups. We put braille you know, labels and large print um, writing on the different sections. Um, we um, had them all cut out and labeled. And we had students build their plate with the different sizes so they could get a kind of a tactile idea or a visual idea, depending on their vision, of what a, a healthy plate should look like. Okay, so obviously here you should have more vegetables on your plate than you should have whole greens, whole grains. Okay, your meat, pro your meat or your protein section should be a little smaller than your vegetables and your fruit, surprisingly, should be the smallest section. Okay. Um, and then they have all kinds of hints, and there's all kinds of lessons. So this is just a nice tactile way um, um, to demonstrate how to make a healthy plate. Don't fill half your plate with macaroni and cheese, and then you know um, the other half with you know six drumsticks. You know, making it a balanced plate. So it's a nice way to to show that. Is everybody familiar with that? Has anybody else um, heard about myplate.gov? Anybody used it? You had no idea, Andrea. Well, now you do. <laughs> Anybody else had any experience with my plate? Oh, hey, Christine. Appreciate the resource. Huh? <laughs> okay, well. Go ahead and, and look it up. It's tons and tons of information. Great for um, elementary. and So you've got reading. You've got tactile skills. Braille, if you're doing that. Ooh, my plate does not work. Oh, you know what? Um, choose my plate. Ah, OK. OK, thanks. Choose my plate.gov. OK. Thanks for the resource. Thanks for the correction. Okay, next one. All right, um, and the last one thing I want to tell you about is directionsforme.org. Has anybody used this before? It's a website that makes packaged food directions accessible to the blind or low vision. Anybody out there familiar? to noise writing in. Yeah, we've used this a lot at the Lighthouse. You've got to bring your iPad. Uh, students have used their, their smartphones 
or you just bring your laptop into the kitchen. Oh, okay. So I got a link here. So it's designed to completely make um, uh, give accessibility with text-to-speech readers, um, magnifiers, braille displays, um, and and smartphones. Okay, any information that is on a packaged food, a better Betty Crocker cake mix, a hamburger helper box, a Tyson chicken nugget bag. Um, um, craft macaroni and cheese. Anything that's a packaged food that has in, that has print information on it. Most of them are available on this website, and we're going to go through and do one. Okay. 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 Cause I, yeah, I was able to open the link before. <laughs> All right. Bear with me as I pull up my browser, guys. Okay. Oh, I'm getting a little finger here. Can I just try? Uh, sh you'll have to share your screen. So on the right hand side where it says share my screen in that pod, you'll have to click that. Okay. What, what, what would be easier? Do you do it or me do it? Here, I'll go ahead. And you'll do I'll it? Do okay. it. So you're, you're more of an expert than I am. <laughs> Thank you. Not you know. that. No. Yes, no. you are. <laughs> and so I'm going to directions for me. Is that correct? Everyone can see my screen? Yeah, I want everybody to see how we do it here. So, there I go. everybody able to see? You all can see that. Oh, Cynthia says she tried opening. You tried opening my plate or directions for me, Cynthia? Okay, that's what you're supposed to see is directions for me. Okay, okay. so this. <laughs> so, if you scroll down, you're seeing the Andrea. Slide. Over there, little bitty. Yeah. Side. Teeny tiny. It's teeny tiny. Oh, well, let's yeah. make it bigger. I apologize. So if you just make it full screen, I just did that. Uh, mm. Give me two seconds. Sorry. I had any technical difficulties. This really is a really good website that I want people. To okay, it should be bigger now. Okay. Okay. So this kind of introduces the um, the concept of the website, okay? Brought to you by Horizons for the Blind, okay? If you um, go down to the search box there and type in Tyson's Chicken Nuggets, you have to put the brand in. You can't just say Chicken Nuggets. You can't just say so Tyson's Chicken Nuggets. Oops, Nuggets. 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 <laughs> and search. Voila. There you go. All kinds of Tyson's. Tyson's Chicken Nuggets. So we'll go ahead and click on that first one. Oh, wow. Okay, and if you scan down, okay, so it's all JAWS accessible. JAWS will go through all the links and tell you what's on the page. Okay, and from nutrition information. Let's go back up and you can see the step by step directions. Okay, go up a little bit more. Okay, there you go, directions. So, um, you know, you enlarge on your iPad, or you've got Zoom text, or Jaws is reading it to you. You've got everything available to you. Um, it's nice. It's just a text-based website and yeah. uh, links. Um, this is a great way to use assistive technology while you're cooking. Yeah, I had, a, I had a video. I just I didn't have room to keep it. But I had a video of Angel, the young lady who was doing the cucumbers, of finding um, the Hot Pockets on, on my iPad. Um, finding the directions for the Hot Pockets on this website. And so she's, you know, using the Zoom feature um, and reading the directions and finding out how much time, because she didn't know how long they cooked in the microwave. So super simple. Um, you know, are 100% of the packaged foods available in there? No, but most of the ones students are eating are on there. I think so, this, Sorry. This is pretty cool. It says new. Get directions instantly with our new barcode scanner. Barcode so scanner, they might, yeah. They might have an app. Um, oh. But it's $160. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing Fine. cheap. All right. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, if you can get, you know, get it subsidized for yourself, why not? So that's a really great website. Try it out with, um, with students using the technology that they use to access. Um, information.
Any questions about that? Any questions so far? I'm just about done. I'll end with my last picture. Here's the crew. We made the picadillo. <laughs> and there we are with our frying pan, our electric skillet, with no kitchen, yep. no running water. Very One thing I have learned this year is to have a small tub of, of soapy water nearby. So you can just quickly rinse hands, you know, if you're in between touching, you know, something raw or sticky. Uh, so a little tub of warm soapy water. It's not going to stay warm, of course, the whole time. But soapy water, just so you can do a quick hand rinsing and, and drying. Three bucket system, Girl Scout style, wash, a rinse, sanitize. Oh, wash, wash, rinse, exactly. sanitize. <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia, you should have done this one instead of me. <laughs> She's selling good gut at all. <laughs> oh, this was great, Sherry. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, it was fun putting together. Uh, I like doing the videos. and Yeah. So no, I appreciate you all signing on to, to uh, learn how to cook without a kitchen. I hope everybody got some good ideas somewhere to start. So. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Yay. Thank you, Sherry. I think the biggest thing I, I, I just, you know, it's always those good reminders, just providing that success in the kitchen, no matter how big or small. Like you said, you can't make a sandwich without accessing the bread. So if you can just make that one accommodation and make it easy for them to get to that bread instead of having that frustration right away, uh, exactly. it's, it's so important. And often sometimes I feel like we get hung up like, oh, they have to be able to open this package of bread. Well, no, hold on. No. <laughs> Let's <No. laughs> yeah. do some backwards chaining you know um so i thought that was really important a good a good reminder um and lots of lots of great skills and lots of great videos showing what your kids are doing in class it, it brings it home and one thing i encourage you all to do is share this webinar with your parents once we get it posted oh, yeah. online because sherry you bring the parent perspective so to to hear it from you and and to see what you're doing with your your students and hear about what you've done with matthew i think um, that will help hit home to them so please guys share this with your um your parents of your students it's a wonderful resource um and uh the the um sheet that you held up earlier sherry if i could get that and scan it and i'll send it to okay. everyone so they can sure. use that as well i think that'd be good um so yeah, any questions for Sherry? Cassidy. You're welcome, Wendy. Hi, Erin. I know you're out there. I didn't say hi yet. Erin was my intern many years ago with an elementary student, a kindergartner who was full of spit and vinegar. <laughs> and she, she learned by fire. <laughs> didn't you, Erin? <laughs> cool, awesome. OK, so before we. Yeah, I'm doing that right now, Kay. Kay is my reminder that we're doing evaluations <laughs> before we sign off. So, And then I'll give you your closing code. So go ahead and um, complete these polls for me. They are almost all open. Are they open? I think they are. Oh, oh gosh. Man. I didn't put answer keys in some of these. Oh, goodness. I'm in trouble here. Hold on. <laughs> Two, three, four. Five. Ah. Six. Oh, I see. You didn't put the little rubric. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Just when you think you're done. Okay, bear with me. Okay, oh. that one's open now. The first one's open. Second one's coming. I, it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. Who knows people? We just have to pay attention. Judge so kindly. Attention. <laughs> yeah. Ah. <sighs> So one is greatly on the first three, and then I flipped it on number four. So um, I'm keeping you all on your toes today. Um, and then please answer number you know, five. What is one thing that you will take from this session and implement with your students in the class? Oh, we can't read the whole question because I have it scrunched up. I'll let you guys get that in. Yeah, the portable device is definitely. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, teaching part of the activity. That's one thing. When I do parent workshops, we truly talk about how you're just focusing on one part of that. You, I didn't 
expect them to go home and teach their child how to cook spaghetti from beginning to end that night. It's start with just simply turning on the stove to boil the water, orienting to them to the stove top. Thank you, everybody. Good. Excellent. Okay, so closing code. Let's come up with one real quick. I already used of glove. That was my favorite thing. Um, well, we'll do electric skillet for the closing code. Electric skillet. Um, and then your homework, as Sherry had mentioned in the webinar, is um, um, to write a lesson plan on something that you saw on the webinar today or whatever is going to work for your students. The skills that you have assessed the need in, please go ahead and write a lesson plan on a, on a simple um, cooking without a kitchen lesson. Um, and make sure that your goals are uh, SMART goals, that they're specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Um, she gave some good examples in her uh, in her slides and also some great objectives that you can focus on in a lesson. Um, so that will be your homework. All right, let me go back to collaboration. Make sure nobody has any questions. Oh, you're welcome, Christina. I'm glad you joined us. Yay! I'll go ahead and quit. Bye, Tanoi. I miss you.